How are you guys doing today? Good. 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 These brave souls in the front, I like it. I like it. I'm a professor, so I appreciate when my students sit in the front um, when I instruct, but um, most of the time I know I'd probably be in the back, so appreciate y'all in the front. And I do pace, so I apologize. I, and I did give one presentation where they made me stay on the sa stage, and I thought I was going to go crazy. Um, so I do wander around and I do ask questions and there will be people who have microphones that are going to help me um, with some interaction because to be honest with you guys, it's not fun to stand up here and listen to myself speak for an hour. Um, so I appreciate you helping me out and answering some questions and interacting. So I'm Andrea Bjornstead. I'm an assistant professor at South Dakota State University and I teach counseling. So I am a licensed professional counselor. And when I started in SDSU Extension about I think this is my fifth year, I decided um, to combine my expertise with what was happening in agriculture. So my dad is a farm, farm machinery dealer. I grew up near Canastota. How many of you are kind of from the Canastota area? Anyone? Somewhat? Woohoo! <laughs> okay, so I grew up in the Canastota Marion area, um, and I grew up around farmers. And so back in 2015, I decided to conduct my first study to find out well, what's happening with the mental health of farmers and ranchers? So I'll go through some of that today. Um, some of what I discuss will be somewhat heavy. So this is much different than what you've covered so far. Uh, I know you're learning about soil health and, and crops and that sort of thing. So today we're gonna, my presentation is on mental health. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about farm stress, what stress looks like, what it feels like, um, and when do we know when stress turns into more of an issue such as depression, or uh, another mental illness. So we'll, we'll kind of cover some of that today. And again, I do appreciate a lot of interaction. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is just a brief overview. I'm gonna cover the differentiate, I'm gonna differentiate between mental health and mental illness because the two terms are used interchangeably, but they're very different. Uh, and then I'll talk about some South Dakota suicide data. And you're probably wondering, well, how does that apply to me? Well, I don't know how many of you have paid attention to the national media lately, but um, how many of you have read articles about the suicide rate among farmers and ranchers and how it's increasing? How many of you have read those articles? Um, so it's gaining national attention. It's actually an international concern, so I'll cover some of that. Um, gaining national attention. And so I'll cover the South Dakota data and we'll talk about well, how that, might that apply to you. Um, mental health of agricultural producers, the environment right now, and um, I'll, I always over prepare and never get through everything because I do like to hear your stories too. So if you have something to share, please raise your hand. If there's something powerful that you want to say, please do so. I've had so many different stories shared of, of different struggles or challenges or even success stories of, hey, I struggled a little bit and this is what I did. So to differentiate between mental health and mental illness, mental health uh, is our optimal state of well-being. So when people, when you ever hear advertisements say, let's talk about mental health, it's not a negative thing. It's not, a, not negative. We should always be striving for positive mental health. So it's our optimal state of well-being where we can contribute to society, we can contribute to our relationships, our um, jobs, our um, uh, community, those sorts of things. Uh, and it's also a place where we can cope with stressors. What happens though is sometimes we experience so much stress and that's what's happening with producers right now. All of you guys are experiencing, I mean, nobody is immune to stress. We all experience stress at some point. I do too. I'll talk a little bit about my own stress signs as well. So we get all of this stress and what's happening with producers is that it's turning into chronic stress. So, you know, we went through years of drought, right? And now we're experiencing lots of precipitation. So the, the weather is unpredictable, market prices are unpredictable, and what's happening is it's turning into chronic stress. And, and chronic stress is much more difficult to manage than our just our everyday stressors. So it's building up and building up, and what do you do with that stress? Sometimes we have difficulties managing it. So optimal mental health is where we can cope with those stressors. So sometimes all that stress builds up and that can turn into a mental illness. And a mental illness is a diagnosable medical condition. Now, does that mean everybody with a mental illness gets diagnosed? No, because there are people out there that have depression 
that never go and see a doctor for it, that are never treated for it. Um, so uh, it's a medically diagnosable condition. It must impair multiple areas of your life. So it just can't impair your, your job. It has to impair your relationships, your thought patterns, your behaviors, all those sorts of things. It's a result from various factors. So we kind of have that nature versus nurture debate. I don't know, um, it, it kind of goes on and on with mental illness. But what we found is that it's a combination of both. That it's a combination of genetic factors as well as environmental factors. But the hope is, is that it can be managed. So sometimes we experience all this stress, all this stress, and then it can turn into depression or anxiety. So we'll t I'll talk a little bit about where's that line at. One in four Americans has a mental illness. So take a look around the room. One out of every four struggles with a mental illness. Four out of 10 people have received mental health treatment. So what's happening is that, you know, it's kind of a debate, to be honest with you. Some people say that we're just, um, gaining more awareness around mental illness and that more people are willing to seek treatment for it. Thus, the, the rate might be increasing. But four out of 10 people have received mental health treatment. So I'm gonna dive into a little bit about South Dakota suicide data first to kind of set the tone for what I'm gonna discuss with all of you. If you take a look at the number of suicides in South Dakota from 2009 to, 200, to 2018, you can see that they increased. We had the highest is there a pointer thing on here? I'm sure there is. I'm scared to press the wrong button though. Woo, <laughs> I guessed right. Okay, so as you can see in 2017, we had 192 suicides reported. That's the most that has ever been reported in South Dakota. We had the sixth highest suicide rate in the United States in 2017. So what happened between 2017 and 2018, this is my hunch, just my hunch is that we in South Dakota did a lot of preventative work on suicide and that helped decrease our suicide rate. So 192, now why does this apply to all of you? If you take a look at the South Dakota suicides by age and sex, we have females in the turquoise and males in the, in the purple. Who is leading every single category? Rural males, rural males. The biggest concern is with our, our younger uh, males, the, the age, age 20 to 29. And a lot of the research is actually suggesting that our younger producers are the ones that are struggling more too. So the younger males. And so I'll ask, when I present, I present at lots of different, uh, uh, with ad organizations, and I'll ask questions. And, and they'll say, well, you know, older, Older people have gone through the 80s crisis, right? They experienced the 80s crisis and we prepared for, we experienced it and now we're more prepared. Well, our younger folks haven't experienced anything like this. Thus, um, maybe why our younger farmers are, and ranchers are struggling a little bit more. But if you take a look at our 30 to 59 year olds, they're not that far behind either, okay? So being rural and being male, are risk factors for suicide. So it's the tenth leading cause of death in South Dakota. It is the second leading cause among ages 15 to 34. With 192 suicides, we had the sixth highest suicide rate in the United States in 2017, and 78% of the suicides were male during this time period. So globally, right now, and this, I mentioned that this is an international concern. Globally, right now, agriculture is one of the occupations that experiences some of the highest stress levels. And one that experiences some of the highest suicide rates. I don't know if I have my people with microphones around. Yeah, okay. So I kind of want to hear your perceptions of what is it about agriculture that's so stressful? You guys can shout. I can, I can get down too, if I don't lose microphones. <laughs> okay, so what makes agriculture so stressful? Shout it out. Weather. Weather. Prices. Market prices. 
financial. Yeah, financial. What about financial? Debt payments. De debt payments? Yeah, bankers want to get paid back. Yeah, bankers want want their money, right? They want their money. So loans, getting loans, obtaining loans, is that stressful? We're fiercely independent and don't want to share. Don't want to share what? Don't want to share our problems okay. with others yeah. because we're fiercely independent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Did everybody hear him? No. Oh, I need you need to say that to everybody. <laughs> well. I'm scared I wouldn't get this stuff back on if I take it off. <laughs> I was just saying we're fiercely independent, so we don't want to share our problems with others. We wouldn't be in the occupation we're in if we weren't fiercely independent. And uh, uh, since you want a story, I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah, and absolutely. I, Thank give you. Give me a microphone. It's scary. <laughs> I like but, it. But I can tell you this, that at home we started a production group, a small production group of about six producers. started with a banker, a broker and then some producers. And we were doing this in hopes of learning how to be better producers and how to make more money. Within two months, within two months we became a mental health group. The banker dropped out, the broker dropped out, and it was just us producers. Uh, we weren't very close when we started, we're incredibly close today because we learned that we could trust each other and that we could share. And uh, it, it's been an amazing thing for me personally being able to go into a group that I can speak in confidence with, knowing that they're going to—they're um, not going to go blab it to others, and and I can get things off my chest that ended up being very very similar to the same stressors that they had. Okay, so I, I have to quiz you a little bit. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to happen to everybody that shares. Don't be shy. Um, but I'm wondering what was helpful to establish trust in your group. Time, time, and communication. It's similar to uh, a lot of rela any relationship that you have. Uh, mm -hmm. Any relationship you have between in your family or otherwise, the more time you spend together uh, in communication that you have, the more you can learn to trust. Okay. So how long have you guys been meeting together? Uh, it's over two years now. Okay. Over two years. Okay. We just met in the last week. Okay. And it's been wonderful. One guy's gone through an almost divorce, and, and really I believe through the counsel of the group, He's reconciled with his wife, which is an amazing success story. Um, one guy had to refinance and sell some land to get back into shape. And I also think that it was through the support of that group, he was able to weather that storm. So there's been some great successes come just from our small group. Oh, very great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. You might squeak. Oh. Because you get your two oh. mics you don't need two of them. <laughs> I don't know. As long as everybody can hear me. Groups can be a very powerful thing. I actually teach group counseling, so I, I appreciate that. Groups can be very powerful um, because if you establish enough trust and cohesion, then you, you have that opportunity to share your struggles. And um, people, people give you ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Ideas and, and different ways uh, to cope, cope with it. So I, I appreciate your story. What else? is going on that agriculture is different with stress? Lack of special, lack of proper succession planning. Oh, lack of proper succession planning. Tell me more about that. Yeah, she's coming with the microphone. Because <laughs> I'm guessing you're not the only one that's thinking that either, right? Too many times I think fathers stay in farming operations too long and when they turn it over their sons don't or daughters don't have or they haven't grown into the responsibility of the farm because dad has made a crucial decision all the time and when it gets dumped on through death all of a sudden they don't know how to cope with the stresses of those crucial decisions we have 40 chances in life that's somewhere between mid-20s and the mid-60s. Why do we want to have 60 chances? Why not let, get out of the way and let the next generation grow into those decision-making processes? Sure, sure. What do you think is hard about leaving agriculture, though? You mentioned that father stayed too long. What's hard about leaving? Air conditioners. 
He said air conditioners make it hard to leave. You're worried the next generation won't be able to continue what you've built over the years. Okay. You're worried the next generation won't be able to continue what you've built. Okay. Do you want to expand anymore? She's offering the mic. Nope, that's good enough. <laughs> Okay, so worried about the next generation. So what I, I hear kind of multiple components going on. The, the, sometimes, and I'll work with farm families too. Uh, you guys don't mind if I pace, do you? Awesome, thank you. Because it's hard to talk to the back from the front. In the front, I'm sorry, you'll have to turn around a little bit. Um, I hear two different things though. When I work with farm families, I hear about blurred boundaries. The blurred boundaries between uh, the father and the son, or the, the multiple generations can have blurred boundaries of, sometimes I hear about, uh, why well, don't, the son doesn't get to do fun things because the father still wants to do all the fun things like he's used to doing, or different, different responsibilities, they don't want to share responsibilities. But I also hear you saying, you, you in the middle there, saying um, maybe, maybe we need to work a little bit more to prepare the next generation. Would that be accurate? I don't know, I, I need some more thoughts on this. I'm not an expert on preparing the next generation, but I'm an expert on establishing strong boundaries in the family system in order to cope with stress, so. What we found when we went through succession planning is the institutions really don't want dads to retire because the institutions have faith in the wisdom of dad, but they're afraid that when dad steps back and gives a total authority to the next generation, the wisdom is not there. So they're not as willing to stick their neck mm. out with the younger generation. So the institutions become a hurdle in the fashion. Okay, so what I hear you guys saying a little bit is maybe our younger farmers are struggling a little bit more. Number one, from maybe lack of preparation but number two, lack of trust. People don't trust. Like maybe they're having difficulties obtaining loans because they're used to the older generation, that sort of thing. Okay, what else makes agriculture stressful? We've talked about market prices, we've talked about weather, we've talked about succession planning. Um, what else makes it stressful? I guess what I wanted to say is why is it always got to be all or none with fathers and passing it on to the next generation. Why can't they work with them? Uh, I know my operation with my father, they kind of set you up and made decisions together, but you still had your little heel to fail on. You didn't take the whole thing over to fail on it. We're going to get you started. We're going to work together day in, day out. But and you can fail in small ways instead of just turning sure. it all over to the sun and say, okay, I'm done, we'll figure it out. Sure, absolutely. And that's where those, with, with that transitioning, it's so important to have those boundaries, right? Of, hey, um, maybe we can merge this uh, operation together. Maybe we can pass this operation on together. It's not a, here, I'm going to drop this in your lap and you're going to expect to have to do it all, right? Because may, maybe we're setting people up for failure if we just drop it in people's laps, right? Sons' laps or daughters' laps. I don't want to discriminate here. Because there, there are women in agriculture, there's you know, lots of stories about women in agriculture and women definitely help on the farm. And I'll, I'll actually share what's happening with females right now too in agriculture. But okay, what else is stressful? You guys in the back, don't make me come back there. Because I will. <laughs> What's stressful? Anything else? Long hours. Long hours, yes. Can't get you past. I can't go past here? Oh, you guys are saved. <laughs> You're all saved. <laughs> you guys are not. <laughs> They're all like, can I switch to the back now? So unkind. He's in the doghouse. <laughs> okay, so long hours, because when I talk with, especially women in agriculture, they'll talk about how there are no breaks. That some day, days you work from dawn to dusk and, and, you know, in the middle of the night, right? Long hours, what else? Women. Women? <laughs> <laughs> They're not part of the operation, that's what we're referring to. 
The wives that are not part of the operation. Yes. How so? They don't always get along. The wives that are not part of the operation do not always get along. Are you talking like multi-generational families no. or? Uh, no. In case of a brothership, brothers in a partnership. Okay. Okay. So women. Yeah. Women in the room. <laughs> not really. <laughs> Women in the room, how do you feel about this? Most of the women are back here and I can't cross this line to get to them. Stressful. Women are stressful. No, you're I'm stressful. I know, I'm experiencing stress. I need some support. Okay, so women are stressful. Um, as a woman, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what to say to that. Partners, partners, yeah, partners. partners. Would that be more accurate? Well, they're they're experiencing their their women, but part. I'm sure part like women in the back. How many of your partners are stressful too? <laughs> thank you, thank you. It can go both ways, right? So relationships. What I hear you saying is, relationships can be stressful, right? Whether it's the father son relationship, <laughs> whether it's your relationship with your significant other. Um, maybe you have multi-generational, maybe you have, um, you know, grandparents, parents, you, kids, multiple generations. So our children also experience our stress too, right? So I have a nine and seven year old daughter. I have two daughters, nine and seven. And when I'm stressed, I can go to zero to 10 really fast. I'll start heading toward the front so you guys can see me a little bit better. But I can go to zero to 10 really fast. And when I go to zero to 10 fast, what do my kids do? Yeah, they can do the same thing. Run. Go to zero to 10 fast, right? They run the other way. Yes, thank you. So some of them, it depends on the kid, right? Every kid is so different. Those of you that have kids um, understand that not, they're, not, they're not the same child. Um, so some of them will go up with you in intensity and some of them will run will run and separate and and ha they have that fight or flight response right right so mom's worked up so either i need to fight back or i flight right so children experience our stress too even our toddlers your toddlers experience your stress okay even the little ones so let's talk a little bit about stress most people experience stress daily we're not immune to it i experience stress you experience stress right Day. Every day. Yeah. You guys experience stress over here. We all experience stress. Okay. So we experience it when we perceive a situation as dangerous, difficult, or painful to cope with, and we do not have the resources to cope. So we've already mentioned some examples of farm stress, right? We've mentioned weather. We've mentioned market prices. We've mentioned, um, some of you did not mention this, but one of the top stressors in my regional study were healthcare costs, right? Um, we mentioned relationships. We've mentioned, some people mentioned like illness with your, your livestock, right? Um, planting, right? Planting season, planting late. Some of you planted really late this year, right? Due to moisture. Some of you had a hard time getting your crops out of the fields. Um, so, different farm stressors. Some, what some of you have also described is this overlap in the business, right? Your farm operation. We have this overlap where if you have a farm family, the business, you as an individual and the family are all mixed in in this farm, right? Sometimes there's no separation. So I'll talk with the women in the room. If I can make my way back to them, they might say, there are, there are no breaks. We don't get a break from the farm. And I'll talk with men who say, my hobby is my farm, right? All we do is talk about farming, it's shop, right? We don't, we don't ever talk about anything besides shop. We don't talk about anything besides the farm. What happens if we're struggling with our farm though? It's all bad. Oh, all of this feels bad, right? All of this can feel bad. Your family can feel bad, right? Your relationship with your significant other. If you're, you talked about being an independent, proud person, right? That farmers are independent, proud people. Well, if your significant other 
They can feel your stress. We already talked about that. Your children can feel your stress. Your family members can feel your stress. So if you're stressed and you're not talking about it, what happens to your significant other? What do they do? Go shopping. <laughs> Go shopping. <laughs> well, that would be a way to cope. <laughs> but what else? What does your significant other have to do? They have to guess how you're feeling, right? They have to guess how you're coping. Well, they can see on the outward signs, they can see your signs of stress, but if you're not talking to them, they don't know how serious stuff is in your head, right? So all of this gets messy, this, this stuff right here gets messy when it's all about the farm and the farm is struggling, right? So some signs of chronic prolonged stress, these are things I want you to think about, not only for yourself, but right now, as a farming community, we need to take care of each other. And I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening in agriculture soon, even though I'm talking way too much and, and pretty soon they'll cut me off somehow. Um, change in routine. So if there's some type of change in routine uh, and the, lives, the care of the livestock declines, the care of the farmstead declines, that's a sign that Hey, maybe we need to have a conversation. As a neighbor, let's, let's have a conversation. How are you doing? Um, increase in illness, increase in farm abstinence. I, I talked with a farmer at Dakota Fest once who told me, I cannot sleep. I have all these things going on in my head and I cannot sleep. And the other day while I was driving my tractor, I fell asleep and drove it through a fence. So our increased stress can contribute to farming accidents. And you all know that agriculture has one of the highest mortality rates from accidents too. Appearance of the farmstead declines, children show signs of stress. So when you experience stress, where do you notice it in your body? Just shout it out. Shoulders, they feel heavy, right? Painful, what else? Your head, headaches. Headaches? I really want to go to the back. I can't believe they're not letting me go to the back. Where else do you feel your stress? Stomach. Stomach. Oh, yeah, your stomach can feel sick, tight. I was super nervous before I came in here because you guys, there's, there's a lot of people in this room, right? Okay, so I was feeling my stress in my stomach. I had lots of butterflies. Those of you in the back, where do you feel your stress? I'll make someone with the microphone go back there soon. Don't be shy. Where do you feel your stress? Your chest. Chest. So you can have rapid heart rate, right? Feels heavy. You know, some people when they experience really, really intense stress feel like they're having a heart attack. It can also turn into a panic attack, right? Okay, so your chest. So what I want you to think about is we're at, in agriculture, Chronic stress is happening. So the first thing you need to do is recognize when you're stressed. And how you recognize when you're stressed is where you feel it. Because sometimes the thought isn't, oh my God, I'm stressed right now, is it? No, it's, wow, I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it physically. You feel your stress physically first. So it's important to recognize where you feel your physical stress. So some signs of stress, I'm gonna go through these. And I want you to make a mental note of which ones apply to you, okay? I also want you to make a mental note of what your family would say would apply to you because they're very different. They're very different. Because sometimes family members notice more things about us than we notice about ourselves. So some cognitive symptoms, memory problems. I know that when I'm really stressed, I'm constantly asking Siri to remind me of meetings. Now, to Siri, Siri's not always she never understands what I'm saying half the time, but she gets the gist. Um, inability to concentrate, maybe some poor judgment. Uh, I had a farmer at my last presentation say that when I'm stressed, I don't think things through as well. Seeing only the negative. When we're stressed, we can spiral really fast. 10 minutes, are you serious? Oh my gosh. <laughs> we can spiral really fast. We can only see the negative. Anxious or racing, racing thoughts and then that constant worrying. How many warriors do I have in the room? 
How many of you worry? Don't be shy. It's usually three quarters of the room. Here, lift your arms up again. Look around the room. Are you alone and worrying right now? You're not alone. <laughs> Physical symptoms. We kind of talked about a lot of these. The aches and pains, the chest pain, frequent colds. Emotional symptoms, moodiness. I kind of talked about my irritability when I get stressed. One of the biggest red fla flags, I want you to think about this in terms of yourself, your neighbors, your friends, your family members. One of the biggest red flags is that loneliness and isolation. If somebody starts to withdraw, it's a huge red flag. So I had a farmer come up to me after a conference I presented at, and he said, one of our friends just died by suicide. He was a producer, just died by suicide. And we saw that he withdrew, he stopped hanging out, he stopped um, coming to the bar, talking, he stopped, he stopped talking to us, he started drinking more, and we just always thought he would come and talk to us, and he didn't. So I want you to think about that, that it's not always going to be, hey, I'm struggling, I need some help. It's more you going up to that person and saying, I care about you. I've noticed these changes in you. And I care about you. Behavioral symptoms, um, sometimes we're stress eaters. We eat too much or too less, sleep too much or too little. Um, we can procrastinate. Sometimes we turn to alcohol, cigarettes, or drugs. I'll ask in my presentations, what do you guys do to manage stress? A lot of times I hear, I drink, right? I drink. And some people will say, I, I go to the bar. Well, the bar is a great place to socialize, right? You'll see friends up there, that sort of thing. But there's a fine line between socializing and then drinking too much to cope. And that's where if somebody comes up to you and says, I'm concerned about your drinking, people are noticing that, that maybe you're coping ineffectively. So I covered all those signs of symptoms, or signs of stress. Now I want you to take a look at this list. These are the symptoms of depression. How many of these symptoms of depression are signs of stress? Most of them, right? So that leads me back to that question. How do you know if you're stressed or how do you know if you're depressed? And that's so hard sometimes because that line is blurry. If it's pervasive, if it's persistent, if you can't shake your feelings of general unhappiness, maybe you're hopeless, maybe um, you have all these, these different signs of stress and you cannot shake them and you wake up every day and you cannot shake these, that's a sign that you're depressed, that you're experiencing depression. If somebody comes up to you and tells you that they're worried about you, noticing changes in you, that's, that can be a sign that you're experiencing depression. Now, don't get me wrong, when I'm stressed, I crawl into a hole for a couple days, and I kind of, I, I isolate myself, my family's, my, I have an identical twin sister, she'll call me and she say, she'll say, Andy, are you in your hole right now? I'm like, yeah. It's okay to go into your hole for a couple days, but if I went there for two weeks and didn't come back out, is that concerning? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so if it's pervasive, if it's persistent, if you can't come out of those feelings, it's a sign that you're experiencing depression. They're gonna cut me off soon, but I do wanna talk about what's happening. Um, so the depression rate is increasing among farmers and ranchers, and the literature is suggesting anywhere between 7.4% to 20%. I have conducted three studies so far. In 2015, and I have these slides, but I won't get to them. In 2015, my research showed an 8.7% depression rate. 2017, with South Dakota farmers, it jumped up to 17% in two years. In 2019, my regional study with South Dakota, Michigan, Missouri, and Kansas, we had 600 producers. 29% of farmers reported mild to severe depression symptoms. 29%. A little over one out of every four. 
it just keeps increasing. Um, in 2012, the CDC listed agriculture as the highest occupational group for suicide, and then they retracted the data. They retracted the data, and they, they basically said, well, we know farmers and ranchers are struggling with suicide. It's higher than the, than the general population. Some research is actually suggesting it's higher among producers than it is with veterans right now. So my takeaway for all of you guys is notice your stress signs. If people are telling you that you're concerned, that they're concern, concerned about you, it is it's a strong point that maybe you need to start being concerned too. Talk to each other. I know that there's a level of competitiveness in agriculture, right? I'll, you know, I presented, the, the first time I ever heard that, I was out at West River with, the ran, with a, uh, a group of ranchers, and they're like, well, we can't talk to our neighbors because we're in competition with them. But you have to let that go, because right now you're all in the same boat. You're all in the same boat. If you looked around the room, you're all worrying about probably the same things, right? So is it okay to talk to each other? Absolutely. I love that group. If you can form a group of, of friends, that you, of other fellow farmers that you can talk to, you build a support network. Yeah, did we you? We did purpose on purpose. We, we made sure that each producer was at least 20 miles away from each other to okay. help get, get away from that competitive nature. Okay. That's whenever we were designing it. Okay, so he's saying that when they designed their group, the farmers were at least 20 miles away from each other, so they weren't in competition with each other? What's the main reason? What's the main reason? reason okay. Find that support network. Talk to your significant others. Okay, I do want to skip there. Ha, huh, because we need to talk about our females. I'm not leaving you guys out. Okay, so if you take a look at my research, um, where am I at here? Okay, this was a, yes. So, back in 2015, I said there was an 8.7% depression rate. 3.1% of females reported symptoms. In, in 2017, it was 17%. The females jumped up as well. But what you'll find are the females are struggling more with anxiety. So why are the females engaged in agriculture struggling with anxiety? Throw out your ideas, quick. <laughs> They're worried about their husbands. Somebody said their husbands are a pain in the asses, so <laughs> I probably shouldn't swear considering he's taping me. I'm just repeating what, this, what somebody said. Okay, so they're worried about their significant other, right? What else? All they hear are bad things from the farm. All they hear are bad things about the farm. They're assuming more leadership roles too. They are assuming more leadership roles, absolutely. More responsibilities on the farm, more leadership. I've also been hearing more about spouses, the females having to take off-farm jobs to support health, health insurance, to provide health insurance, to support the family farm, right? So lots of them are not only working on the family farm, they also have their outside farm job, right? Okay, so not only should you be concerned about yourselves, you should be concerned about your significant other, because if you're not talking about your struggles, they're having a guess, which only increases their anxiety too, right? If you're not telling them all the negative things that are happening on the farm, they're making assumptions about how bad it is. Okay, so communication within the family is so important. Open communication, talking about what's actually happening is important. How am I on time? Nobody's cut me off yet. I have five minutes. Do I need, should I open it for questions though first? I have so much more, they're cutting me off. Okay. If you have a loved one who is struggling, do not hesitate to ask the tough questions. Okay. If your significant other, your partner, doesn't talk about their feelings, I know it can be worrisome. I know you have to guess. 
but don't hesitate it, or if you even have a neighbor who's struggling you've noticed that the farmstead's declining in appearance you've noticed different things do not hesitate to ask are you thinking about killing yourself that's a hard question to ask you know i had a friend who was struggling well as a counselor i actually asked the question quite a bit um, but I had a friend that was struggling and I interrupted the conversation and I said, I know you might be mad at me for asking this, but I have to ask it because I care about you. And I said, I hear your struggles. I hear what you're talking about. Are you having any thoughts of killing yourself? And he said no and kind of explained. And I, I at one of my more, more recent presentations, I had a female talk about how, um, a neighbor, a young male, died by suicide, a farmer, died by suicide. And she, um, her son had said, Mom, you need to go talk to this person. Um, and she didn't make it over there in time. If you have concerns about somebody, do not hesitate to ask the question. That's, if you take anything away from this, please take away that. That person may be angry with you, but I, as a person, I would rather have them be mad at me than be dead. Okay? Start talking. Start talking, whether it's to your pastor, to your spouse, your family members, your neighbors. Find someone to talk to. Don't hold it inside. And I know it's easier said than done. How do you know you're not going to say the wrong thing? You know, what's, what, what's interesting, though, is this type of stuff isn't black or white, you guys. And it, just by asking the question, are you thinking about you're killing, killing yourself, you're not planting it in their head. You're not planting it in their head. There really isn't a wrong thing to say. If you come about it as, I'm concerned about you, and these are the changes I've noticed about you, that's a great place to start. Now, do you want to throw it? Do you want to throw them a curveball? Like if they sit down and, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, are you thinking about killing yourself? I mean, is that a great way to start off a conversation? Yes. <laughs> no. Do not throw them a curveball like that. Do not gain up on them either. I've had situations where uh, people will do some type of group intervention. If I had a group of my friends sit down, like say five of them sit down with me, and they're like, we're concerned about you, and are you thinking about killing yourself? What's the first thing I'm going to want to do? Probably run, right? So individual conversations may be more, more of a better, a, a more effective approach, okay? So I sit down and chit chat first. Chit chat first, hey, how's it going? How are things going? Chit chat, and then lead into, hopefully you have that door opener of, you know, I've noticed some things and I'm really concerned about you. But if I sit down and I throw you a curveball right away saying, hey, are you thinking about killing yourself? Not an effective way of, of communicating that, that concern. Okay, other questions? I know, we're ending on a very heavy note. Any other questions? I hope I gave you something to think about at least. Recognize your stress symptoms. I didn't really talk about stress management because I ran out of time. But hopefully you have some method of stress management that is off the farm. I will repeat that again. Effective stress management off the farm. Because if you go back to those spheres I was talking about, how everything is interrelated, you don't escape, right? Okay, stress management, healthy stress management. If you have questions about that, I'm happy to give ideas. I'm gonna skip to the end here. Woohoo! See, I had so much more to talk about. Look at that. Um, well, Avera has a farmer stress hotline. It's free, confidential, and available 24-7. So call in with any concerns that you have. I talked to one of the directors a couple weeks ago and he said, we have farmers calling about various things. It's not, always, it's not always about suicide. It's not always about depression. Maybe they have some questions or concerns. Um, 
So that Avera Farmers Terrest hotline is always available, and then you also have the Helpline Center too. This is my contact information. If you have concerns about somebody you need some help, I'm more than willing to help you connect to resources. So sometimes after I give presentations, I'll receive two or three emails saying, or, or a phone call saying, hey, do you have any resources in this area? I'm interested in seeing a counselor in the Rapid City area. Do you have any suggestions? I just talked to a producer a couple days ago where he's been um, trying to see a counselor. And finding a counselor is kind of like shopping for shoes, guys. And I'm, I'm a counselor, I'm well aware of this. So it's kind of like shopping for shoes. Do you find the right fit your first time? No. I like to think that I can connect with everybody, um, but that's not always the case. So um, if you see a counselor and it just doesn't feel right, don't stop trying. And so this, this, this man um, wanted to know kind of hit my perceptions of what he should ask when looking for a counselor. So don't hesitate to contact me if you're concerned about yourself, a loved one, that sort of thing. I'm always willing to help, okay? On that note, I'm sure they're gonna cut me off now. <laughs> But thank you for your time. I feel very honored to be here and talk to you guys. Thank you.